Church, I have been so excited to walk you through the Believe series, the 30 biggest ideas found in the Bible. And today is very exciting because today we are on a spiritual practice that's one of the most exciting found in the pages of Scripture. It is this basic idea that when you became a follower of Jesus, He deposited something very unique in you. It's called a spiritual gift. It's not only exciting to discover what that is, but it's even more exciting to actually live it out in the purpose that God has given you. So I'm so excited as we open up the Word of God to you today. And today, Pastor Scott Jones, my good friend, is going to do that for you. So church, on the count of three, let's give it up for Pastor Scott Jones. Ready? One, and a two, and a three. Way to go. Well, hello, Westside. It is so good to be with you guys right here in the North Sanctuary, a South Sanctuary. If you are over at the Speedway campus, hey, guys, over there. If you're watching online, uh, so good to have you guys with us. And a special shout out uh, to some old friends, Chad and Amy McDonald in uh, Queen Creek, Arizona. Good to see you guys. And uh, give our online crowd a hand today. Yeah. So uh, when we got married, Donita and I got a lot of duplicate wedding gifts. And more than any other, we got these picnic baskets. You know, the kind with place settings and a little blanket inside. And most of them didn't have any receipts, so we couldn't take them back. So we did what you do. We gave them away to other people for their own wedding presents. And there was this, there was this one couple that we had kind of been getting to know. We didn't really know them that well, but we're like, we're going to give them one. And they got married about six months after we did. And, you know, nobody was the wiser. About two years later, these people became our best friends, and they invited us over for dinner one day, and we're having dinner and finished dinner, and then they brought out the picnic basket, and I was like, whoa, this must have been an awesome gift for them. They set it down on the table, they opened it up, they lifted up the blanket, and inside the blanket was a little note that said, Dear Scott and Donita, Congratulations on your wedding, love, Aunt Myrna. So we were caught re-gifting. Anybody ever get caught re-gifting? Yeah. Here's another, but maybe more penetrating question. Uh, do we re-gift when asking people to serve at church? I've seen it. You've seen it. Maybe it's happened to you. You know, we kind of re-gift by saying, hey, I want you to serve in this area based on a need, not on a gift. And we try to re-gift by giving somebody our gift to get them to serve. And they're like, well, that's not really my thing. It's not really my gift, but I really want to be helpful. And so, okay. And God says, no, 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 no. You do it that way. And at best, you'll be marginal. But I want you to be unimaginable. And this is exactly what we want to talk about today. If you're new online, if you're dropping in, if you're dropping into one of our campuses, uh, we are in this series covering the 30 big key ideas of the Bible called Believe. And these are the things that we are laying down as a foundation, and we're using them to move us forward in becoming like Jesus. This belief series is about 10 key beliefs, 10 key practices, and 10 key virtues. And today, we're in week seven of our key practices covering the area of spiritual gifts. Very, very important topic, and we want to come at this from God's angle because God is not, and hear this, a re-gifter. God is not a re-gifter. So we're going to start with a little bit of a, a definition, uh, but first, what I want you to do is open up your Bibles, if you have one, kind of an old school page that turn, or if you've got a new school, a screen that scrolls, kind of put your finger in 1 Corinthians 12, if you want to open up uh, the beginning of your Believe book uh, to page 275, you get to the beginning of the chapter, but this is the key question that we're talking about today. What gifts and abilities has God given me to serve others? Now, maybe you've never thought about that question. Uh, maybe you're thinking, what's a spiritual gift, and why does it even matter in the first place? Well, there's this guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, and he was writing to a community much like our community, and this idea of spiritual gifts was a little bit confusing to them. So his lead-in was this. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be, say it with me, uninformed. Now, Westside, are we uninformed? I don't think we're totally uninformed, but I think some of us might be a little bit uninformed. 
We've been talking about this reveal study that we did a while back, kind of uh, helping us to indicate where are we on our spiritual journey. And there was one question around this idea of serving and gifting, and it goes like this. I serve those in need through the church one to two times a month or more. What do you think the percentage was? Shout it out, anybody? Five, 14, 20. The answer is 23%. So I wanna get a sense of what 23% is. So online, Speedway, wherever you are, South Sanctuary, right here, everybody stand up. I hate when he does that. Okay, I know, I get it. Uh, so this group right here from here over, you can sit down. The rest of you, this message is for you, okay? <laughs> no, you can be seated. So let's start with a little definition, and I, what we're gonna do is unpack this definition, and I think it's gonna not only give us a greater understanding of the topic of spiritual gifts, but hopefully give us greater movement in this very important practice of our spiritual life. So here's the definition I wrote. Spiritual gifts are God's chosen abilities given to God's people to serve others so that the body of Christ becomes like Jesus in order to accomplish God's purposes on earth. So uh, I know it's a mouthful, but I wanna build this message around four words that are represented in that definition. And the very first word is the word providence. Providence. Because the first thing I want us to get our arms around is that this is the work of God. It's not my doing, it's not your doing. We don't get to choose our gifts. We don't go shopping for our gifts and nobody else gets to give them to us. God gives them. In his infinite wisdom, he knew who we are, where we would be serving, who we would be interacting with, and he gave us gifts for that purpose. He's been doing it for centuries. If you go back into the Old Testament, God gave supernatural abilities to people in order for them to build stuff and to explain stuff. If you look at the building of the tabernacle, God had some very, very unique details that he went built in to the tabernacle and he gifted certain people to do it the way that he had designed it. Here's a picture of the tabernacle and you can see there's a lot of detail in terms of uh, curtains and stonework and woodwork. And the writer Moses said that this is how God had wired this thing up. He brought people into play, he said it like this. God has chosen and filled Bezalel, son of Uri, and Oholiab, son of Ashimach, with skill to do all kinds of work as engravers, designers, embroiders in blue, purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen, and weavers, all of them skilled workers and designers. The tabernacle was so important to God. It was the epicenter of worship for the nation of Israel that God says, I want it done a particular way. And I don't want anybody just signing up to do this. I'm going to embed spiritual gifts in people for a temporary season to do it the way that I have designed it. It's that important. And by the way, archaeologists have just uncovered the identity of these two guys that did all the work on the tabernacle. And I don't know if you've seen them before. Yeah. 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 It's not true. So then there's this other guy by the name of Daniel. Uh, Daniel was uh, pulled out of Israel as a captive. He was in exile in the nation of Babylon, and he was serving the king of Babylon, him and some other guys. They had been brought into the king's courts. And uh, God had given him supernatural ability to interpret and explain dreams, okay? Then one night, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, very disturbing dream. He, he wanted to know what it was. Life and death was, was kind of resting on the interpretation of this dream. He pulled all of his astrologers together, and he said, I want you to not only tell me, uh, interpret the dream, I want you to tell me what the dream was. And if you can't, I'm going to execute everybody, so the word gets out and Daniel starts praying and all of a sudden he's brought into the presence of the king because somebody said, hey, there's this guy, this Jewish guy named Daniel, he can interpret dreams. So he brings him in, puts him before him. He says, hey, I heard you can do this. Daniel, very careful not to say, yeah, I got this. No, 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 very, very careful. Here's what happened. The king asked Daniel, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? 
Daniel replied, <laughs> no, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. That's a good phrase to put in the gap of any time you don't know what to do, but there is a God in heaven. And so Daniel goes on to interpret the dream, not only saves his life and the lives of those that are around him, but he gets elevated at the highest place in the kingdom, and it brings a maniacal pagan king to his knees to acknowledge that the God of Daniel is the one true God. Unimaginable. And that's what happens when you use the gifts that God has placed within you. Now, fast forward into the New Testament. The same idea of providence is in play. 1 Corinthians 12, the writer Paul says, there are different gifts, but the same, say it, spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. This is a God thing. And this is a beautiful thing and something that can set us free because I've seen a lot of us get hung up on this. We need to know this. God, okay, chooses your gifts. So celebrate, don't compare. Don't look at other people and go, oh, I wish I could be like her. Oh, I wish I had his gift. If God wanted you to have that gift, he would have given it to you. He knows the fullest expression of his life and power in you is through the gifts that he has given you, not anybody else's. You will absolutely flourish under the freedom of knowing your spiritual gifts, your heart, your ability, your personality, your experiences, and you can contribute those to something grand that God is doing in the world. Second word, second word is point. Meaning these gifts, these spiritual gifts, who are they for anyway? Now I know that might sound like a, a trick question, right? If God gave the gifts to me, they're for me, right? They're mine. No, but yes, but no, but yet, you know, you know what I mean? It's kind of a both and they are for you, but they're not for you. If you are a Christ follower, and that's an important phrase, when you placed your faith in Jesus, God placed you in his spiritual family, also referred to as the body of Christ, a very important phrase in this conversation. And maybe if we look at our key verse, that will kind of help us a little bit, okay? So just as each of us has one body, with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So it's an all skate. <laughs> I mean, everybody gets a gift. Everybody's included. Nobody is left out. There is not a follower of Jesus on the entire planet that hasn't been uniquely gifted by God, who hasn't been given at least one, if not multiple spiritual gifts. But it's not for you. And that's the point. The gift is for others. We don't look at our spiritual gift like, my precious, you know, I got my little spiritual gift. You know, I'm gonna keep it to myself. Nobody can get access to it. It's my gift, it's for me. No, 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 no. It's not about that at all. I mean, look back at the, the key verse here. Each member belongs to all the others. See, here's the bigger idea. God gives, here we go. Oh, not it. <laughs> I got ahead of it. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to the. Uh, let's go back to the Mr. Potato Head. Okay, so here's the idea: the human body, right? God, in this infinite wisdom, he he wired this thing up, uh, this body of Christ, like a human body, and no human body uh, exists for itself. 
And this is what the scripture teaches us. They exist for the other parts of the body. If you were an infant and there are certain parts of your body that refuse to work together as you get older, this is what you end up looking like as an adult. It's really warped. And in the same way, we don't want a warped body of Christ, God says. And so God gives us a gift so that we can be a gift to others. We're a gift to the body. This is the point. That's why when you turn the page on 1 Corinthians 12, after a long treatise on spiritual gifts, the entire chapter 13 is all about what? Say it with me. Love. It's all about love. Why? Because love is the purest expression, the greatest way in using my gifts for me to actually say, it's not about me. My gift is for you. This is what he's actually saying. And I love how you are expressing love as the body of Christ right here at Westside. Here's just a handful of you guys in action. People praying as they get ready to go out into the parking lot. And how about a shout out to those guys who are out there in the cold all the time? <laughs> Woo! Volunteers serving at one of our activities. I love these kids doing this. I love young people serving and greeting people as they come in the door. Oh, and a latte? Come on. You got to love that. Just serving with our hospitality there. Speedway, one year anniversary. Congratulations to you guys on that. And then our online ninjas. These are the guys, online community, that are talking to you right now, tweeting, communicating with you. It's awesome how they serve our online community in that way. Handing out bulletins, saying hello, representing the chiefs, a spiritual gift like none other. And then teaching our kids so that they're becoming like Jesus. Our killer production team that are always on point. And I don't really have any idea what that is. Um, but this is the body of Christ in action. It's cool. Third word is the word power. The thing about these spiritual gifts is that they're supernatural. They're given to us by God. That's the providential part. But then the power of God is flowing in us and through us to do something that we simply cannot do on our own. And that's why this key idea is really so important. Let's say this together. I know my spiritual gifts and use them to fulfill God's purposes. And that's really easy for us to say, right? But how are we doing really? And I want to poke around a little bit to make sure that we get beneath the surface here. Is that okay if I poke around a little bit? I need a yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and if I was a doctor, this would be the point where I would say, this might hurt a little, okay? Because it'd be easy for us just to ask the question, am I serving, and kind of leave it at that. Because there's probably not a person in this room who would be able to point to something somewhere and go, yep, check. But to do that and to leave it there would miss the deeply biblical and theological invitation behind God's design. And so we want to probe this just a little bit further. And if you go back to the key verse in the New Living Translation, there's a phrase here that's really important for us to understand, and it looks like this. He says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things, say it, well. How do you know if you are serving according to your spiritual gifts? You do it well. You're good at it. And, and this is really, really important, not just in your opinion. <laughs> it's affirmed by the people who watch you do it. See, the internal litmus test to know if you are serving out of your gifting is enthusiasm. The external litmus test is affirmation. People are going, wow, that's amazing what you do. That is the big deal. And I think one of the best, uh, one of the most courageous, dare I say, deeply theological questions we can ever ask anybody is this. Do I do this well? 
because we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the people we're serving, we owe it to a lost and broken world, and we owe it to God. We're not just plugging a hole, we're not allowing ourselves to be re-gifted by anybody, we're not just signing up because somebody needs something, we are serving out of something that God has put inside of us. Because what is the alternative? I can tell you what the alternative is. The alternative is guilt and re-gifting. Somebody like me stands up on a stage like this and he starts guilting people into serving because there's a need. He brings up like a fourth grade girl who doesn't have a teacher or something like that. By the way, Landry, could you come on out here? So Landry, uh, you're a fourth grader, is that right? Yes, Pastor. Okay, and Landry, is it true that you don't have a teacher right now for your fourth grade class? Yes, Pastor. And, and Landry, uh, so right now, is it true that nobody uh, on Sunday morning is teaching you about Jesus? Yes, Pastor. Now, Landry, isn't it true that when they're little fourth grade girls like you who don't have a teacher and nobody's talking to them about Jesus, they end up running away from home and joining the circus? Whoa. Just say yes, honey. Yeah. Now, does anybody want Landry to run away from home and join the circus folks? Anybody? No. Now, and, and I go on and on and on, and eventually some guy in the very top row says, if you'll shut up, I'll do it, okay? And when he does, who wins? Nobody. Everybody loses. The volunteer loses because he's now placed in a, in a situation where he has no passion or gifting, Landry and her classmates, you lose, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they got somebody who doesn't really care about kids and isn't gifted to lead them to a place where they're gonna discover the wonder and the adventure of following Jesus. The pastor loses because he's getting that job back because that guy's gonna quit. And then God loses because nobody gives God glory for things done poorly and without passion. But there is another way. So give Landry a hand as she goes off. There's another way, and this is why we do this thing around here called shape. Maybe you've heard of it. And if you're around Westside long enough, you're gonna hear somebody say, what's your shape? And I know that sounds a little bit like a Christian pickup line, you know? Hey, baby, what's your shape? And, you know, guys, don't do that. You might get slapped, okay? Uh, but there's, there's something behind this that is a theological application to this idea. Shape is all about spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. It's to understand that God made you on purpose for a purpose, and when you discover that and you begin to serve into that, now you are on to something. Everybody wins. There are no losers in that situation. So when you're expanding the idea uh, of this key verse, Paul kind of teases this out a little bit, and he says, so if God has given you the ability to prophesy, Speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. In other words, do what God has given you, not to the best of your ability. No, 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 that's not the point. To the best of God's ability within you. You see, our body isn't a container for our gifts. It's a conduit for God's power. Everybody say, I'm a conduit. I'm a conduit, that's right. God flowing in and through you. Because God's power is most fully realized when a person with a gift is matched with a person with a need and they come together. The passion that is brought into that space, the service that is provided to those people is ignited from a spiritual center that is placed there by the designer himself. That is unimaginable. Last word, purpose. What is the grander thing that's going on here? You see, when God's power is released in and through us by the use of our spiritual gifts, 
everybody starts to grow. You grow as an individual, we grow as a church, we grow in Kansas City, we grow as a global body of Christ. This is absolutely huge. And you might be thinking, oh, you mean we get more people? No, 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 that's not the point. That will happen, but that's kind of a byproduct. I'm talking about growth in becoming more like Jesus. There's this really cool idea that's found in Ephesians chapter four. The purpose of all this is to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is a mouthful. The fullness of Christ? What even is that? But that's the point. That's the purpose. And let me see if I can kind of help you uh, understand what that would look like, okay? I'm gonna put something up on the side screens here, and I want you to stare at the four dots in the center for 15 seconds, and then you're gonna see a white screen, and I want you to tell me what you see. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Keep staring. What do you see? Say it. Jesus. Now, if you didn't see Jesus, there's a class for you after the service, okay? <laughs> but here's the bigger idea, guys. When people stare at you long enough, they see an image of Christ. Not only as you as an individual, but all of us as a community. And then the grand global body of Christ. People look at us and they say, wow, that looks like Jesus. And here's the point on this. Using our spiritual gifts is what God uses to help us become like Jesus so we can accomplish God's purposes on earth. And I wanna build on something I said a little bit earlier. God gives you a gift so you can be a gift to the body so the body can be a gift to the world. And folks, I think you know this. There is a, a hurting world of lost and broken people out there who are desperately needing hope. And they're just watching and waiting and wondering, do we, as the body of Christ, have anything to offer them? And if we do it this way, we will and we do. And that's why unlocking this door is so important. Opening this door and finding out what is behind it and doing what it is inviting us to do. And let's say this together. I know my spiritual gifts and I use them to fulfill God's purposes. And when you come through this door, when you unlock it and you step through, God will unlock something inside of you that is incredibly powerful. And I want you to see how he did that for Tara. A little, let's see, about eight years ago, we'll say, I had been dating my hus now husband for uh, three months, and um, we wound up pregnant, and um, I was terrified, terrified. I did not, uh, I, I don't know how to take care of children. Like, I, there was no way that I could be a good mother. There's just, there's no way. Like, I couldn't be pregnant. So I was driving down, um, and there was a huge billboard that just said, got pregnant. I got a call. This is, this is, you know, I'm gonna call this number because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to call. And so they got me in right away. And I had told them my backstory, you know, about how there's no way I could be a good mother. And, um, and they gave me an option. They told me to, that I was qualified for a sonogram. And I went in and up like on the, the ultrasound, it was like this little, you know, little beam. And uh, it was heartbeat. And it was amazing. I, I walked out of there. I thought, this is it. Like, this is so cool. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to get myself together. And then I never looked back. And we had another child. And I started going to Westside and, and decided that obedience was on my heart this year. And I took a spiritual gifts assessment with Amy. Every time I do a shape assessment, I always pray in advance over the shape assessment and over the person that I'm gonna be meeting with. And just, I'm asking God to prepare my heart so when I meet with them, I can give them really clear next steps. So I had no idea what Tara's story was, but I started making notes after my prayer time, and I had written down advice and aid as one of her next steps. 
And um, so then we began talking about ways that I could um, serve. And she had mentioned this place, um, they do crisis pregnancy. And so like I started getting really nervous, like what's she gonna say? And so she, na she named a place and I didn't recognize it of course. And I asked her where it was at and realized that that was like the place that literally changed my life. So I was like, oh. I'm gonna tell it my story. <laughs> and so when people step into their shape and start serving within their gift set and their abilities and they use their story and their experiences, they start to experience this fullness of life that Jesus talked about in John 10, 10. It's really, really cool. The test in general, the assessment was spot on because before I was kind of floundering and oh, maybe I'll try to work here and I wasn't feeling it, but I felt like, oh, I have to because that's what I'm supposed to do. I am super passionate about shape. I absolutely love it because I love seeing people come alive. You really do see people come alive when they start getting into, um, it, when they start realizing they were made on purpose for a purpose and they step into their calling. It's, it, it's really, really cool. And now I'm expecting a third child. I just never in my wildest dreams ever. And I'll tell you, I've never felt chosen in my life, ever, ever. And I feel chosen because I've got three children. I knew that only God could orchestrate this because He is such a God of redemption. And so it was so cool to see how God was bringing her story together and how He does not waste a hurt. God chose me to be a mother. And that's really cool. To be chosen to be a mother is the most amazing gift that I've ever had, and then to be able to give back, and if I can even help one person through this spiritual journey, um, I have to do it. Yeah, you can do that. See, God didn't give Tara just any old gifts, and he certainly didn't re-gift. He gave her gifts according to the story that he was writing for her. And here's the final word. God uses your shape to redeem your story. You are chosen, and God has chosen spiritual gifts for you. And when you step into your shape, when you unlock your spiritual gifts, God will do something powerful within you, and together he'll do something unimaginable in accomplishing his purposes on earth. So let's pray together. God, thank you that in your infinite wisdom, every person who is a follower of Jesus, who is listening or watching to this, has been endowed with the spiritual gift in order to put you on display so that the world can see, so that we can mature until ultimately all things are brought back into harmony with you. You have done your part. Inspire us to do ours in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there is a perfect next step for you. Our Shape Come and See assessment is tonight at 6.30 right here on the Lenexa campus, also on our Speedway campus. If you want to find out more about that, you can check out your bulletin. If you want to take the Shape assessment, uh, go to westsidefamily.church slash shape and get on board with that. And then together, we're going to see God do some pretty powerful things. Things. I want to remind you that there are prayer partners here at the foot of the platform and online if you need prayer for anything. And now you can stand for this closing benediction. If you just want to receive this, you put your hands out to God and say, God, make this true in my life. Now to him who is able to do infinitely more than we ask or even imagine according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church, the body of Christ for all generations, both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. amen.